Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to start off this year's. I'd like to welcome home, Dr. Dan He's actually a graduate here from the in 2014. He's actually from Medellin. He corrected me, Medellin, Colombia. He moved to the United States, Sarasota, when he was 15. I went to Sarasota and then went to the University of Florida for undergrad and then came to USF. I was fortunate to work with him as a medicine clerkship. Um, he worked with a lot of us, uh, and it was very refreshing to tell him that he was required to pursue a career in academic medicine. Uh, he matched at MGH um, for his residency training. He stayed there. He was recognized. Someone needs to mute their mic. Uh, he was recognized at all uh, three levels of training at MGH. He was recognized as the best teacher as a resident, then served as a fourth year chief resident and actually won best teaching award from the third year medical students at the end of his chief year. And then his first year on faculty he was recognized by the residents as the best teaching uh, or best attending at MGH. Uh, his current uh, role is the associate program director for Sound for the residency program. His uh, primary areas of focus is, includes focus, but also clinical reasoning. He's going to give us a talk today on. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to Dr. Can we close the door? Well, hello everyone. That was entirely too kind of an introduction. Um, thank you, Dr. O'Brien, and thank you all for coming. Thank you for those of you that tuned in online. Um, it's great to be talking to people in person again. Uh, I think we're all a little zoomed out or teamed out, depending on what your modality du jour is. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about common cognitive errors and, and, and clinical reasoning and sort of how they affect diagnosis. And so I hope to give you an interactive talk that actually will give you, that will have sort of things that you can take away at every level in training, ranging from clerk to a acting intern to a resident to an attending. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So I. Um, there we go. I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest. I will disclose that I'm thrilled to be back in the U.S. I uh, will also disclose that I want to thank Drs. Ledford, Lazama, O'Brien, and Sinnott for this very kind of And I also want to just take a moment and pause just to tell you a little bit about what it feels for me to be standing here. I used to sit as the clerk. As a clerk, I sat like right over there. Um, it's pretty surreal. Um, so this is me with my white coat ceremony in 2020. Um, and this is the place that I learned to doctor. This is the place I learned to care for the suffering and care for the sick. This, this, this means so much to me to be here. The other thing is I actually got my wife here. Um, this is us on our graduation day uh, back in 2014. And I'd be remiss to not mention the fact that it's a little funny that I'm here talking about diagnosis to people that taught me how to diagnose. You have no business listening to what I'm about to say, right? And the list also you know, is beyond Dr. O'Brien and Dr. Fetter, Dr. Lazama, Dr. Ledford, Dr. Mateja, right? There are too many names for me to mention. I can't actually tell you the imprint that you have left on me and how I think when I take care of patients. So I just, I do have to say that. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm gonna give it a try. So here are uh, the objectives for the session. So by the end of the session, I will have been successful if you can understand the terms heuristics and cognitive biases and how they relate to diagnostic errors. If you can describe common heuristics, examples of common heuristics and cognitive biases, specifically the ones that plague us the most in inpatient medicine. And lastly, practice strategies to mitigate these cognitive biases as they arise in the clinic. I don't have to tell you if it's not apparent, but it was morning report that like drove me to want to be an internist, right? It was seeing people manipulating information in real time, recognizing patterns and making diagnoses. It was diagnosis. I joke around. I say a lot like diagnosis is like my cocaine, right? Like I don't I don't do cocaine, but like a great case and, and I am strikingly similar to somebody that's intoxicated on cocaine. So um, and it was it was morning report. It was rounding um, with my mentors and watching them ask questions and examine people at the bedside. 
and like making diagnoses in real time. That was that's what it was for me. I would posit that for a lot of people that chose internal medicine, that was a similar reason that drove them to that. It was the solving the puzzle, it was the detective work. That's what it, that's what I was waking up in the morning. But unfortunately, it doesn't always go right. Misdiagnosis is is both common and costly. It's common depending on what autopsy study you read. It can be up to forty percent of the antemortem diagnosis are incorrect. And it's also costly, right? Everything stems from diagnosis. So if you don't have the right diagnosis, the patient is going to unfortunately incur a lot of morbidity and possibly even mortality. And it's also more likely to be negligent in a court of law. And so why does this happen? Well, it's because diagnoses are made by our very imperfect human brains. And we take clinical input, wrestle with it. We have diagnostic output, and then that leads to a management decision. And what we find is that most cases of misdiagnosis, the locus of the error is actually the clinician's brain. And in those cases, cognitive biases and heuristics are, are overrepresented in the mechanism of error. And I'm going to posit to you that, that most misdiagnosis can be lumped into two central themes. They can be uh, lumped into errors of prevalence estimation or what I would term errors of ego. And I'm going to get back to this in one second. But in errors of prevalence estimation, that really refers to the fact that we as doctors are kind of bad at estimating pretest probability. Right? We don't really understand prevalence and underlying probabilities very well. Turns out more recent studies have suggested that actually we're not great at post-test probability here, but that's a talk for a different time. And then the second theme is an error of ego, and I don't mean hubris. I don't mean like this sort of arrogance that leads us to, you know, overt arrogance that leads us to, to make a mistake. I'm referring to the tendency that we have, the innate human tendency we have to fall in love with our first impression. And to actually then perform mental gymnastics to push a square peg through a round hole to make your diagnosis happen because that was the first thing that came to your brain and you fell in love with it. I'm guilty of it. We all are. So here's our roadmap for the day. We're going to start out with heuristics. What is a heuristic? <laughs> so no clinical reasoning talk would be finished without mentioning sort of the seminal work of two cognitive psychologists, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. And they were cognitive psychologists in the 60s and 70s that set out to basically figure out how humans make decisions, how they judge probabilities, and how they interpret data from the outside world and then make a decision. In this work, and it's, it's sort of very famously uh, capitulated in, in Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And in this work, they postulate that there's two central cognitive systems that we use to make decisions. System one is what, what we would know as intuitive, almost subconscious, non-analytical pattern recognition, right? And then system two on the converse is slow, intensive, effortful, analytical. And the fact of the matter is that it's a bit of a false dichotomy. We usually are probably talking between them in real time a lot. But this was sort of their central thesis. Now, what is a heuristic? A lot of people use the term heuristic interchangeably with cognitive biases. That's not true. A heuristic is simply a cognitive shortcut that we take, representing system one, based off patterns that we've previously learned. Right? It's how you can be on your phone, driving home, and then really not think about it and end up in your driveway. Right? It's why Dr. Petter, if I say to him, Weight gain, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, distended neck veins can diagnose heart failure without really even thinking about it, right? It is a, it is a sort of a mental, um, it is simply comparing patterns um, to stored representations of diseases that we have. Now, the reason we bring up heuristics is because a lot of, because when heuristics go wrong, they result in cognitive biases. And cognitive biases we know are overrepresented in cases of misdiagnosis. We talk about two heuristics that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, um, one is representativeness, and then the other is availability. Now, if you've ever been to a talk on diagnostic errors or on clinical reasoning, um, you're going to expect me to be talking a lot of smack about system one. All right, everyone always smack like talks smack about system one, talks trash about heuristics. But we never stop to celebrate the ninety thousand times a day that they go well. Right. So this talk, while it's going to center a lot on cognitive biases, which uh, stem from system one processing in the most part, does not mean that system one is a bad thing. It evolved for a reason. OK, we as a species needed to be able to make decisions quickly. Right? Long division is not going to help you when you're running from a tiger. Right. So we needed to be able to evolve a system to make decisions quickly. 
System one is not a bad thing. And furthermore, system two, which gets sort of lauded as this, you know, flawless entity that will save all of our patients is actually not the case, right? I will, I'll start by saying that if you spent every single minute of every single day analyzing every single facet of every history, exam finding, laboratory abnormality or imaging abnormality, you would not get to see the rest of your list, right? It is untenable. Plus the cognitive load that it takes for you to be effortfully reasoning makes further cognitive um, efforts prohibitive, right? It, you're going to be too sapped, too drained. We need to be able to make decisions quickly. And what you're going to hear me say a lot is that what you, when you study master clinicians, they're really toggling between these two and they know when to trust system one and they know when more analysis is needed. So this is not a talk to like totally put down system one. It does a lot of good for us, okay? The other point I'll make is that no amount of effortful pausing or reasoning can overcome an inherent knowledge gap. That system two is not perfect, but it's not without its own. So back to representativeness. What is representativeness? It's, um, as uh, Kahneman described it, it's a heuristic according to which the subjective probability of an event is determined by the degree to which it's similar in its characteristics to its, patient or its parent population. That's very confusing cognitive psychology speak. In diagnosis, I think about it more as sort of the tendency to search for a pattern and then select a diagnosis because that constellation of findings matches a stored representation of a disease that's in your brain, which is called an illness script. Okay, it's sort of you see with a patient in front of you, the constellation of findings, you compare that to the Rolodex of diseases that you have in your head and you kind of find a good match and that is representative. And indeed, if you were to look at famous clinicians of, of, of throughout our time pictured here, Sir William Musler, it was said that they could simply walk in a room, ask the patient a couple questions, examine two things, and then figure out what was going on on the spot. And they did that through years and years and years of what you're gonna hear me say is deliberate practice. And you can kind of come up with a little graphical representation of it. So if you can put the probability of the diagnosis on the y-axis, and then the number of textbook findings, and I say textbook meaning a, a, a finding that is consistently associated with a diagnosis on the x-axis here, you can create some thresholds. Horizontally pictured here is the diagnostic threshold. That is the probability above which you feel comfortable calling this what it is, calling it a diagnosis, or even treating for it. And then you can create a vertical threshold, which we'll term the classical presentation threshold, right? That is how the disease is supposed to show up on a board exam, which we know is not how they actually show up on the wards, right? You can also create another threshold, which would be that of an atypical presentation, meaning sort of that the disease is manifesting with less of its canonical findings at presentation. And what you find is that novice clinicians in general require larger amounts of clinical data to be consistent with the diagnosis before they feel comfortable crossing that diagnostic threshold. If you look at that line on an experienced clinician, they can cross that threshold at a uh, at a at a at that atypical presentation number of findings, and they do so by recognition of variability by a clinical experience, and especially in the case of common diagnoses, right? Whereas uh, uh, somebody that is sort of in the middle of medical school is going to need PND, orthopnea, an S3, gallop, RALS, ascites, bilateral lower extremity edema, 17 pounds of weight gain in the last five minutes. A more experienced clinician could simply make the diagnosis of heart failure by the finding of anorexia and distended neck pains. So that is because as people practice, if they practice deliberately, what we start to do is expand that bell curve of what we know is possible for a diagnosis and store that in our illness script for our diagnosis uh, in our heads. Now, I'll call your eyes that the y-intercept here is, is actually intentional. And what we know is that as master clinicians progress through their careers, they place a lot more weight on actual pretest probability and on the underlying prevalence of a disease. So right off the bat, the experienced clinician is judging how likely a diagnosis is by how common it is. And you're going to hear me say that damn old adage that common things are common, and I, I get it. It's hackneyed, but it's also true. Um, so when you're attending, say it on the wards, they're not just sort of blowing smoke. They're, it's, it's because it's true. So I'm going to tell you all a personal case for me where this fell short. Now, just to paint the picture, I was a first year attending. And this was my first time on the house staff, like on the ward with the house staff. So I was really nervous. Um, and uh, so I wanted to make, you know, a good impression and I, I wanted to be liked and all this stuff. And um, and so we had a 40 year old woman. She came in with no medical history and she came in with right upper quadrant pain, malaise and, and anorexia. 
Her vitals were all normal and her exam showed mild right upper quadrant tenderness and negative Murphy sign, no signs of chronic living. But her amino transferases were pictured here. So she had super high amino transferases, significant hepatocellular liver injury. She had a right upper quadrant ultrasound, uh, which really didn't show too much um, uh, in terms of pathology. And now I was seeing this and I was hearing the case and I said, you know, young woman, towering immunotransferase is not a bad setup for autoimmune hepatitis. I think we should send serologies. And we sent them. ANA was moderately positive, 1 to 640, and her anti-smooth muscle was positive at 1 to 160. Now, if there's a happy Gilmore person that likes that there's a reference, it's a shooter McGavin, maybe I'm dating myself, but I felt pretty good. Sniped it, called it from the beginning, right? Nice. But I didn't fail to consider that the pain was weird, right? And I tried again, as we do, to try to push that square peg to a round hole, and I said, capsular stretch, right? <laughs> and what I failed to consider is that during the hospitalization, her pain actually started to improve, and her liver enzymes followed in concert. But the train was on the tracks. It was out of the station. Because of that, because of her positive serology, she underwent a liver biopsy. And it showed ductular dilation and neutrophilic reaction, a pattern most consistent with macroscopic biliary ductal obstruction, and commonly seen, commonly, that's like some stank from the pathologist, commonly seen <laughs> with the passage of a gallstone. I didn't even know gallstones could do this. Turns out they do so, and rather frequently. It's more recent data has showed that uh, transient but significant complete occlusion of the biliary tree, what a gallstone does, can cause towering immunotransferases. They go away really quickly, so we don't catch them, but it's actually rather common. I didn't know that. First off, system two, right? Never would have protected me from that. But what did I do wrong, right? What was my error here? Let me go ahead and tell you my error. The prevalence of gallstones in this country, in adults, is somewhere between 175 and 685 cases per 100,000 people. And we don't have data in the US, but in European studies, prevalence of autoimmune hepatitis is about 10 to 15. I looked at a pattern, I recognized it, fell in love with it, and I put a young woman through an invasive test that actually probably wasn't necessary. I fell in love with that pattern. And I overweighed the findings that confirm my diagnosis. But the fact of the matter is that my pretest probability was off by an order of magnitude. So these are some of the cognitive biases that we're going to talk about today. Um, and uh, starting by which is that I committed base rate neglect. Right? And base rate basically refers to if the last people that came in, the last hundred people that came in with towering transferases, what did they have? Right? And the base rate is the frequency with which those diagnoses manifest. It's also known as pretest probability, and it's very proportional to epidemiology, right? To how common is the diagnosis in general. And base rate neglect is sort of the tendency to ignore that prior probability in favor of what's right in front of you at the time. That's what I did. And that's what representativeness actually puts us at risk for, is that if we are just using patterns and we are falling in love with those patterns, we need to pause and consider a little bit about how common this phenomenon actually is. <laughs> For the aficionados, I also committed anchoring, premature closure, and confirmation biases, but we'll get to those. So how do we pause and how do we how do we combat the representative heuristic, which again is not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's important to stop and just, again, common things are common and diagnostic tests are imperfect. I know that for the clerks here, like you don't think you're better than an x-ray. You're better than an x-ray, all right? You're, you maybe at the end of residency, you'll even be better than a CT scan, but you have to learn to question these things because diagnostic tests are imperfect. And unless you have something with 100% positive or negative predictive value, you have to incorporate probabilities of the game. And the senior attendings here can tell you that, that there's very few, if any, tests that actually have 100% positive or negative predictive value. And again, I'm not saying that crafting the differential based on pattern recognition is bad. It's not. It's how we teach you to think. It's how we think as internists. It's why we can do what we do. However, I think you have to shuffle that differential diagnosis based on probability. So get your output based on that and then shuffle it according to probability. Next up is the availability heuristic. And that's basically a mental shortcut by which we rely heavily on things that either we saw recently or that we can easily recall them. And we can easily recall them maybe because we see them very frequently 
or maybe because it was particularly emotional or salient for us. And really in diagnosis, it, base, it runs with availability. We run the risk of overweighing or underweighing. It can actually skew our probability of how likely a disease is by how easily we can think of it. And it actually can work both ways in terms of, of how we judge probability. It can cause us to overestimate the prevalence of something, as is the case with a rare disease, or it can actually put us into autopilot, which I would posit is the more dangerous of the two. So with regards to prevalence overestimation, you need not say more than everything is ANCA after you've recently seen a case of ANCA best focus, right? You could be a dude that drinks like 19 pints of vodka a day and he's coming in with polyneuropathy and, and then you'd be like, well, you know, this could be ANCA because I did just see ANCA uh, maybe do a little bit of the same, right? And you can substitute TB, IgG4 related disease, FIO, your sexy disease du jour. You can substitute that and it will actually affect how, you, how likely you are to think about a diagnosis um, when you see a patient. And as I said, the other one that I find a lot more dangerous is actually autopilot. And I can think of no other time in recent memory when we as a profession were faced with more of the exact same diagnosis at the same time than the viral pandemic, right? And if you as a clinician are seeing fever, sore throat, lymphopenia, fever, sore throat, lymphopenia, fever, sore throat, lymphopenia, in the last three cases with COVID, 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 that next fever, sore throat, and lymphopenia that comes in, you're going to think is COVID. And that's how you miss acute HIV. And so the point I bring up here is actually, I have created a term for it. I call it COVID blinders. And I find myself obligated with the house staff to remind them that the other diseases didn't go away. Just because there's SARS-CoV-2 in their nose, you're only going to be able to blame it for so long. We might as well start thinking about things here, right? And that autopilot is super dangerous because the fact of the matter is, is that the bear, like the nature of a previous diagnosis in one patient has no bearing on the diagnosis in the next person, that's called gambler's fallacy. And it not, doesn't just apply to diagnostic scenarios, it also has profound management decisions. And if uh, in studies you take two docs, doc one, doc two, and they're both taking care of the same elderly man with AFib and astronomically high stroke risk, they both correctly prescribe an anticoagulant to both of their patients. But unfortunately, patient one has a spontaneous intracranial bleed. So when you study this, physician one is actually less likely to re-prescribe anticoagulation and because of that emotional salience, probably has a very skewed probability of how common they think that spontaneous intracranial hemorrhages are in the setting of toe eyes. So how do, we, how do we keep this in check? How do we remind ourselves of this? Well, I go back to probability and prevalence. Those are, outside of global pandemics, variably relatively fixed. Um, and then remembering that, again, the nature of a diagnosis regardless of how many times you've seen that diagnosis that day, doesn't mean that that's what your next person's going to have. And lastly, with regards to, to, to management uh, decisions, think about alternative outcomes. Think about when something bad happened when you couldn't prescribe that therapy. Or think about all of the people that you did prescribe that therapy for that did just fine. So those are heuristics. Now we're going to pivot over to common, common cognitive biases in hospital medicine. The fact of the matter is that people have spent their entire careers cataloging cognitive biases. It's over 100 of them. Some of them are really weird. Um, I picked these six because I think they're the ones that I see the most on the warts. All right, we're going to go through them. <clears throat> Anchoring, and I'm going to give you some examples, and then we have two cases within this section to talk about sort of real life examples of this. Anchoring is the tendency to focus on a single facet of the case. So for me, it was her young age and the amino transferase. That was like, Frank. that's what I focused on. That's what I anchored on. I didn't really think about, you know, the pain and self-limited nature of it and things like that. Premature closure. We use this one often. It really refers to assuming a diagnosis is final before all the relevant data points have come in. Now, I wrote a chapter on clinical reasoning and cognitive biases with uh, uh, a gentleman named Joe Rensick out of Boston University who's been studying clinical reasoning his whole life. He's written books on it. He's the man. And then he often was quick to tell me, <laughs> he goes, you know, Dan, Premature closure is a lot less helpful than we all like to say it is, because technically all errors are premature closure. And I said, noted, Joe. So, uh, which is true, right? You failed for one reason or another to consider everything before the final the final data came through. So, in my case of the young woman, I uh, prematurely closed after I saw the serologies, right? I failed to consider the pain. I failed to consider the self-limited nature. And I confirmed, which is the next one, which is basically I placed disproportionate weight on the stuff that agreed with my first impression, in this case, the serology. 
Now, this one I feel super passionate about. And it's called the framing effect. And it refers to the skewing of probability that happens based on how a problem or a situation is presented to you. And think about what happens at handoff. Think about how you describe somebody, because as you're doing that, you are framing the listener, right? This can have profound implications of how we perceive patients, of the diagnostic tests that we order for them, of the therapies that we do or do not prescribe for them, right? Think about the terms dementia or COPD or bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. Think about sort of how it can vastly impact how you perceive a patient, right? Now imagine if they're made up. <gasps> Are you saying that stuff in the chart isn't real? I am, right? So God forbid you're passing along false information, right? Has anyone ever seen the term dementia in a chart? It's more contagious than Omicron, right? One dementia, and then it ends up in six nursing notes, the next HNP, all the progress notes, and somewhere along the way, People stop taking a history. Why? They have dementia. No, they don't. They're an accountant. They did their taxes last week. Or if they do, then that sounds like a great dementia to me. So keeping in mind the power that this has and how we talk about patients, it can lead to this. Diagnosis momentum, also known as pass off inertia, right? I mentioned the train in the tracks earlier. When that train leaves the tracks, this guy's getting admitted for chest pain. He needs this, that, that, and we sort of live to check boxes, right? That train is going down the tracks. And it's really effort intensive to put the train back in the station and send it down a separate set of tracks. And I do believe that we suffer from a term that I've coined and I'm calling hyposkepticemia, right? We suffer from an acute deficiency in skepticism in our profession. We're really busy. The words are hard. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work that doesn't always involve actually caring for the patient. And it's a lot easier to say, OK, that checks out. And then let's just order these tests and then prescribe these things and move along. But you can potentiate. Preserve potentially incorrect information if you're just accepting everything at face value and moving with, on with your day. And it can lead to unnecessary diagnostics. It can lead to increased length of stay. It can lead to unnecessary treatment. So diagnosis momentum is very real. And um, I, I added this one to this talk rather recently, and, and so I was just on rounds with Dr. Ledford this morning, and he said like five of these already, so I told him that his team was excused from grand rounds. Um, but search satisfying, um, I added recently, because I was actually seeing so much of it. Um, and it's kind of calling a search off once the first plausible explanation is found. And if you're looking for examples, you need to look no further than our trusty friend, the urinalysis or the anteroposterior chest x-ray, right? UTIs and pneumonias have gotten blamed for so much stuff that is not a UTI or a pneumonia. And don't even get me started about UTI and pneumonia. That's either can be present if they're both present. So it was happening so much that I actually went around and I pulled my colleagues. I said, what's your best not UTI? And I defined a not UTI as what it actually ended up being that was initially blamed for a UTI. Here's a list. And this is not a complete list. Perforated bladder, necrotic bladder cancer liver abscess, diverticulitis, interstitial nephritis, genitourinary tuberculosis, bacterial meningitis, and just this week I saw pneumonia that was a posterior, it was a cerebellar stroke. It turns out that the chest infiltrates that he had was because he was vomiting so much from vertigo. So just so you know, before you trust that they have a UTI or a pneumonia or their close cousin cellulitis, right? Search satisfying. Do not turn your brains off, especially in the case of diagnoses with high misdiagnosis rates. Two more cases. So this is a 65 year old guy. He has a 100 pack year uh, smoking history. His hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and he's coming in with some acute exertional dyspnea. His vitals at rest are fine. When you walk him, he drops to 90%. His neck veins are collapsed. He's not moving much air. He's not wheezing. His chest films show hyperinflation. This is actually his third time that he showed up. Each time he maybe feels a little bit better. He gets discharged, but his exertional capacity is still quite poor. The first time they say, yeah, this is probably COPD. He's treated for an acute exacerbation of COPD. He's given prednisone and macrolide, and he's discharged uh, on teotropium with a putative diagnosis of COPD. 
Andre, I, I can't believe this happened, but he actually went out and got PFTs. <laughs> Almost never happens, but it's awesome. Uh, and the PFTs actually showed only minimal obstruction. He comes back. And he's treated again with prednisone. Given the high pretest probability, he's treated with prednisone. He's now on escalated therapy. He's on a LAMA, a LABA, and an ICS. He shows up the third time. He's admitted to medical services overnight. And because his chart says that he's got COPD based on that chest x-ray and the smoking history, and he's not moving much air, he's again started on prednisone or macrolide. And then the attending the next day takes over, says, hold on, that's false. Pharmacologic stress test is ordered, transient ischemic dilation suggests a severe proximal. So what happened here? Well, again, less useful therapy, but premature closure, right? We heard smoking, we heard exertional dyspnea, we said COPD, and we failed to consider that while yes, that is a common cause of exertional dyspnea in people with heavy smoking histories, so is coronary disease, so is ILD, so is pulmonary hypertension, so is ischemic heart failure. So just know that that differential doesn't stop right there. This was a case of confirmation here, right? You were suspicious for COPD and you heard imperfect lung exam, big old lungs on chest x-ray, good enough for me, despite the fact that you have a relatively good test. Yes, I'm aware of pulmonary function tests. I've done them. They're really hard. Sometimes they're not great quality. And so in the presence of a high pretest probability, it's reasonable to challenge it. But over and over and over again, this man has failed the treatment, the, the test of treatment, right? And it's super important. We're going to talk about it, but using treatment as test, right? If I think that something is, and I'm going to treat you for it, at the very least, you should start to get better. So there was anchoring, like even in the face of the teeth. Then this is a great case of, of sort of how we frame PFL and diagnosis momentum, right? If I tell you that a guy with COPD is coming in short of breath, you're going to think about it a lot different than a person. If I told you the person with heavy smoking is coming in with sort of nonspecific dyspnea, right? Your brain is going to approach those two scenarios very differently. In that first scenario, your threshold to treat him for COPD is going to drop significantly. So again, how we are given a problem, and in this case, a patient, how they we talk about them already influences our thinking of them. Now, I'm going to tell you about a third case. This is the one I had most recently. So this is an independent 72-year-old woman. She lives in the community. She's a retired engineer. She comes in with alternate mental status myoclonus. She has hypertension and advanced proteinuric chronic kidney disease. And though she is delirious, she currently denies any urinary symptoms. And when you ask her husband, she wasn't uh, complaining of any urinary symptoms before presentation. Upon presentation, she has this urinalysis. All your eyes, the fact that there are, in fact, wet blood cells on them. She started on ceftriaxone. Urine cultures are only 10,000 colonies uh, forming units of E. coli. Teams turn over, and actually it's discovered that Gabapentin had been recently initiated. At that point in time, antibiotics were discontinued, but unfortunately, diarrhea and leukocytosis developed. No big deal, right? She stops making urine, develops hypoxemic respiratory failure, and she's still on dialysis. This is search status. Right? Now, I'm not saying don't treat people up front. But when you're dealing, especially if they're sick, I would never advocate for that. But when you're dealing with diagnoses that require skepticism, when you're dealing with diagnoses that have high misdiagnosis rates, cellulitis has a 30% misdiagnosis rate. It means that 30% of the stuff that we're calling cellulitis isn't cellulitis. Right? So when you're dealing with diagnoses like this, please call it a hypothesis, call it a working diagnosis, but don't marry it. You know, Never turn your brains on, never stop being skeptical. And that brings us to how do we avoid this? Now, before you ask, this isn't like my opinion, some of them are, but like the majority of them has either been, you know, based on, on the literature or polling master clinicians on like, how do we how do we fight these, these innate tendencies that we have? So I've compiled a few. Um, it's not an exhaustive list, uh, uh, but there are things that I think we can do in our everyday uh, practice. And here they are. So, using an effortful pause, playing the odds, using diagnostic schema, working in teams, using the medical note, and the importance of following them. Okay, so we're gonna tackle these um, bit by bit.
So earlier in the talk when we were talking about representativeness and we were talking about availability, that was a pause. That was an effortful pause. You stopped to think about what was going on. And as I've said a couple times in this talk already, reaching mastery actually requires knowing when to trust system one, right? Knowing when everything's lining up with the pattern of the disease you have stored in your mind, or when you're entering a quote cognitive minefield and you think that maybe something funky is going on and you need to think, right? So knowing when to trust system to one, knowing when more analysis is needed. And more importantly, and this is the deliberate part of deliberate practice, is actually calibrating system one with system two. If you learn something about a diagnosis that you didn't know previously or hadn't associated with that diagnosis, it's your job to put that in your illness script for it, right? So that next time your system one is ready to just absorb it. So we master clinicians calibrate system one with system two. Again, going back to that suggestion that it's really a false dichotomy, they're often sort of self-informing each other. And just recall that, you know, if we are straying too far, if we're getting into the outlier regions of that bell curve for what we would expect for a diagnosis, stopping and asking things like, what doesn't fit with my impression? Is my patient responding to treatment? Again, the power of treatment as test. What would I expect to see if this were the diagnosis in question? Or are there any other more common diagnoses that could technically account for this? I do think it's worth mentioning that cognitive forcing strategies, which is sort of like trying to sort of effortfully debias yourself, has never been proven to work outside of vignette-based exercises. So there's been like no in vivo, if you will, sort of study of this. It works in vignette-based exercises. People get the answer right, but that's a vignette, and we know that clinical medicine is noisier than vignettes. Doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Um, and as you've heard me say, I do think that the effortful pause requires healthy skepticism, right? Believe everyone, trust no one, right? It's trust but verify. Learn diagnoses that are suspect, right? There's a bunch of them. Take it a step further. Learn mimickers for those diagnoses. The amount of heart failure that I've caught that was steroid refractory asthma, woo, right? So you start to learn and encoding these mimickers onto these common diagnoses that end up having nothing to do with why the patient is sick. And this requires effort. Figuring out whether something is chart lore or whether it was real requires effort right? and time. I would argue that it pays dividends in your patient's care moving forward. You can expose them to less diagnostic tests, to less treatment, right? Going back, well, what was the biopsy? Or how was that diagnosed? What was happening back then, right? That all takes effort, but I would posit it's what our patients deserve. Because the fact of the matter is that we hospitalists are de facto second opinions for every single case that we see. And we will never scrutinize a case the same way we do the first time we see it. I'm guilty of it myself. I have nothing but suspicion on the first day, and then once I come up with my own assessments, that's all honest, I'll be honest. Once the train is down my track, I don't question myself nearly as much as I should. Right? We never have that same degree of skepticism as we do the first time we're going to see a case or a patient. Okay, so that was the effortful pause. So playing the odds. If you're in a desert and you know from weather reports that it rains three days a year in that desert, and the weatherman tells you there's a 90% chance of rain tomorrow. You gonna pack an umbrella? What's the actual probability of rain the next day? It's three divided by 365, right? It's not 90%. <laughs> so as you're quick to throw around words like sensitivity and specificity, and then tell us how good of a test it is, Remember that those are predicated upon the prevalence of a disease and that using something like a, like, like a likelihood ratio or a positive negative predictive value is actually a much more meaningful statement than just tossing around sensitivity and specificity. I am unlikely to diagnose endemic coxie in New England just as somebody is unlikely to diagnose endemic Lyme in Arizona. If those tests are positive without the correct epidemiology, guess what they are? False positives. Same goes for a lot of other diagnostic tests. Just remember, just think about a funny looking horse before you decide to, to marry a zebra. <laughs> so diagnostic schema. This has actually become a big part of my teaching. It's been a, a big part of my clinical reasoning. A diagnostic schema is a, a cognitive framework or an approach for a specific symptom, a syndrome, a clinical problem. And what we know from the ICU literature and what we know from the airline industry and the procedural world is that checklists save lives. And diagnostic schema are just that. They're diagnostic checklists. They are moments that you can stop and consider other alternative diagnoses, right? And these can be self-derived, like how you approach a problem, 
These can be crowdsourced or these can be available in many different resources online. Pictured here, this is not exhaustive, but clinical problem solvers app uh, up to date. There's many more. And if we think about two diagnostic schema that could approach that could help our two last cases, we can see how they could protect us from being biased and getting into a cognitive trap. So if you have an approach to dyspnea in a patient with heavy smoking, you could start and center that diagnostic schema around the presence or absence of obstructive lung disease on PFDs. If they're positive, you go ahead and treat for COPD. If they're negative and your pretest is high, like it was in our case, you can treat empirically for COPD. And if they're negative and your pretest isn't that high, then you would consider doing other diagnostic testing. And you can work in you know, an unfavorable treatment response as part of your diagnostic schema that can actually sort of keep you from, again, following that train down those tracks. For our second case, I like to think about the diagnosis of a urinary tract infection as requiring three separate spheres, culture, pyur uh, culture positivity, white blood cells in the urine, and symptoms. And really only when all three are present do I feel comfortable calling it a UTI. Now, you don't always have the information, and sometimes it's perfect, but this is when I feel safe in system one calling it a urinary tract infection. But we can use that same diagnostic schema to help us in approaching a patient that's been labeled as having a UTI, right? If they have symptoms in pyuria, those overlap in a certain area, right? If they have symptoms in a culture positivity, those overlap in a different area. And lastly, it's important to remember that although we have conflated each of these circles individually with a urinary tract infection as a, prof as a, as a profession, each one of these has its own differential diagnosis, right? So if you're able to store approaches to diseases in your brain like this, it can actually keep you from totally falling trapped to a cognitive bias. Okay, I love being here at Academic Medical Center, right? Because we're always working in teams, not always, but a lot of the time we are. Um, and that is multiple simultaneous first impressions, right? Everybody's going to read this case just a little bit different. They're going to have a different thought about it, right? And the more system one reasoning, the less likely you are to get caught up in one person's bias. Right, so it's a powerful debiasing strategy. I will add that in order for this to truly be a powerful debiasing strategy, you need to have a culture of psychological safety on that team so that everybody feels empowered to bring up an alternate explanation. And it's not just sort of top down from the leadership. Plus, you get to learn. I love hearing how other people think of cases, right? I have stolen, beg, and borrowed from, from many people that I've heard approach cases that now inform how I approach cases. All right, here's my soapbox. I'm really sorry. The medical note, if used correctly, should document what happened to this human being, should distill diagnostic reasoning, why you think what you think, and should employ that reasoning to dictate further diagnostic testing or to establish a treatment. Instead, alongside the EMR, it's been usurped to justify or capture misability. And I got news for you. It's just like when you're ordering a radiology study, garbage in, they will garbage out. So if you give them nothing, they won't give you anything. If you treat the note as a repository for 17 days worth of basic metabolic panels that I have to scroll down to get to your assessment, tell me how that's helping a patient. Right? If you use the note, it can be so powerful. Right? This is an example of a note taken from my institution. I would posit a guess that you've seen similar notes even as recently as today. Right. This is how is this going to help somebody? <laughs> right. This has become a repository for a discharge summary. <laughs> People can copy into the into the discharge module in Epic. Right. Right. Oh, somebody reading this is not going to figure out what's happening to the person or why people are thinking what they're thinking. Right. And then some poor soul has to edit this every day or worse, copy forward it for seven more days. Right. Notes are powerful safeguards. They're literally a built-in system two moment in your day. They should be an effortful pause. You should think about your thinking. The amount of times I've been sitting down, writing my note, and been like, oh crap, I forgot to ask about this, and have to run back to the bedside, examine this, order that, is too large for me to count. This is my debiasing moment. This is the moment I have to think about my thinking. When possible, verbalize it, right? We know from cognitive science that language is thinking. If you're creating language, you're thinking about something. And then the importance of follow-up is what I'm going to leave you with. Some diagnoses take time to manifest, right? And we may only see sort of a protean manifestation of that diagnosis at one point in time. Other times, we're just flat out wrong. 
And in those cases, we wouldn't know if we didn't follow up. Now, I'm a hospitalist by trade, right? I don't have a clinic. I'm like primary care physicians or subspecialists that will follow a patient over time alongside them to figure out whether the diagnosis in question is right or wrong, right? You cannot calibrate system one or system two without longitudinal follow, without figuring out what happened to this human being. And the issue in hospital medicine is that this is effort intensive and it is uncompensated. It does take being a little bit obsessive and checking the record and following up on folks when they're off service. But it is consistently in every single study that surveys how clinicians reach mastery, following up and figuring out what happened to somebody is a consistent theme that comes across every single time. Because expertise does not equal experience, as far as I'm concerned. However, you cannot have expertise without experience. And my mother's a classical pianist, and I always like to quote her. Practice makes permanent. Perfect practice makes permanent. Right? And it's that deliberate practice, right? This is why I've not been saying experience, you know, experienced clinicians. It's people with, that have deliberately practiced to reach mastery. And so that's the talk, and I want to thank you all for your attention. Um, and I welcome any questions or any discussions that you may have. So I have a comment. One, this is a great talk. Um, kind of reminds me of uh, about my journey in residency and fellowship after leaving USF a long time ago, coming back and kind of seeing what's what now. Um, so I kind of uh, um, share your vision and your experience coming back and give a talk. Uh, so kudos to you. Um, the, the two comments. First thing I think that that a lot of when I was a junior clinician, I kind of learned in physician scientist is to think about cases with a syndromic diagnosis. You said this eloquently when you mentioned your COPD case, and people forgot about the cardiovascular risk with those patients. And so as an infectologist, I kind of think of cases like that, where you've got to think about what's really happening on a global scale. And it also comes back to the note. If you just put in your note, you know, number one, this, number two, this, instead of putting the picture together with a syndromic diagnosis in your, in your note, you're missing the boat. And a lot of a lot of house staff who work with me, I harp on that. Like, tell me your syndromic diagnosis. Don't just tell me, okay, they have CAD, they have this, they have that, and it's leading to this pneumonia. Um, and we get caught up with terminology. Like, UTI should not be used. It should be cystitis, or it should be pyelonephritis with or without a septic. And again, that kind of diagnostic um, impression you get from a syndromic diagnosis is what it's all about. The other thing I would caution junior uh, physicians and uh, house staff not to do, uh, which you kind of touched on, is to understand the diagnostic that you're ordering. People forget that how a diagnostic test is run. They don't understand the, the, the science behind it. A good case of what you mentioned, coxie, right? Coxidioides. People forget that it's a complement fixation test. And if you don't have complement around in your body, it's not going to work. So if you have somebody who has rheumatologic disease, somebody who has immunologic disease where complement is consumed, those tests are not going to work. And so I would caution people to, you know, in your practice, anybody's practice, to think about this and understand that, you know, when you order a diagnostic, you got to understand how it works. You have to understand how the drugs you're giving work, antibiotics specifically, at least in my case. So, but kudos to you. This was a nice talk. I think that I just wanted to kind of give a little bit of um, ad advice to the and your colleagues in the room. Yeah, it's definitely like you, you get a lot more comfortable with the stuff that you order frequently, right? And it's a lot easier for you to, we just had a discussion this morning on rounds, the pitfalls of pharmacologic, you know, um, spec scans and MIDIs and things like that, right? And so if you order stuff frequently, it's a lot easier for you to, to you know, call it out and say like, well, you know, you actually know how they run this, you know? And then was like, no, and you're like, well, this is it. And they're like, that's it? Yeah, that seems very subjective. You're like, yeah, so... Totally. I, I totally hear that. It's, a, it's a sort of another layer of like, of obviously, like it starts and ends with the syndrome. And then your diagnostics are the adjunct that help you elucidate the cause of the syndrome, right? So it's very well taken. Well the question in chat. Yeah. Uh, in the area of pathology, how what should laboratory medicine do to help decrease cognitive bias in medical doctors? Ooh, that's a great question. So the question is, in the area of pathology and laboratory medicine, what can the pathologists do to help us decrease cognitive biases? Um, you know, I would just, 
be as explicit as possible in talking about, you know, just because you think that this positive test means this, there's also, you know, plenty of examples of when this test is positive in other diseases. Um, I always find it incredibly helpful when there's often like a, an adjunct in the report that says in patients manifesting with X, 20% of them are Y, 80% of them are this. So I think the more kind of guidance we can be given, because unfortunately medical education has led us to be very sort of um, uh, cut and dry about things and saying, well, if this test is positive, this disease is the case. Um, and that's really, I think anybody that spent half a minute on the wards can figure out how messy and noisy it is. So anytime I, I'm given any more information about the test characteristics, what other states have it, um, uh, are characterized by that test positivity, I think that that's, for me as a clinician, uh, very helpful. What do you think is the role of humility, diagnostic reasoning, and Know, medical errors because I I constantly think what else could it be am I missing something and I'm skeptic of other people but I'm also skeptic of myself and is there any literature on that um that's a great question I uh, I'm sure there is I haven't looked into the literature but it's it's a lifelong journey right that we talk about broadening illness scripts this is a humbling game that we play right and you're like I just I feel very I'm very skeptical or very leery of saying things like you know, I've never seen it do that, you know, which there is validity there, right? Meaning that it would be a very uncommon version of something, but it's it's grounded in, in the notion that that those bell curves around diagnoses and illness scripts are forever mutable, right? And there will always be room for us to broaden our understanding of something because, you know, we're not left pinky doctors, right? We are general interests. If you specialize in like the distal phalanx down of the left pinky, you may be able to see everything that afflicts at one corner of the body, but we're medicine docs, and all knowledge is our province. So it's just too, there's too vast for us to be able to be absolutist. So your point of humility is incredibly important. Awesome. No further questions in the chat. Thanks, everyone.